Hello, my name is Duncan and welcome to one of my hot takes. This hot take is about artificial snags and their related risks. Let's get going. But quickly, we need to set the context for risks from artificial snags and what they are. In science, a snag is essentially a naturally occurring dead dying tree that's still standing up. But as arboriculturists and arborists, we can deliberately create artificial snags. See the image on this slide for a few examples of both. This essentially involves removing the entire crown of a tree with a chainsaw, leaving only its main stem or stems, if it's a multi-stem tree, standing upright. This practice of snag creation is most often done in the UK at least, because the tree has become at risk of failing. Either the tree has died, there's major decay at its base, or it has significant root decay. Creating artificial snags on private and public land is now a common practice in many European countries. The basic idea being to retain some of the tree for its wildlife value and to encourage greater biodiversity to these sites. In addition, sometimes this is done to historic park trees, partly due to their large size and partly, I suspect, so that they're not completely removed and can remain for longer as a landmark. OK, making artificial snags from trees would otherwise be felled sounds like a great plan. What's the issue? Well, the issue is often that when a snag has been created, there needs to be some thought about the risks it still poses as a large standing piece of dead wood. The practice of creating artificial snags has arisen from industry members without any guidance on tree selection, snag management, or how to consider the ongoing risks from snags to people and property. Although one might hope that common sense would be applied, it's not uncommon to find tall artificial snags created within falling distance of main roads, pathways, park cafes, and similar significant targets. Without any formal guidance or science on the risk of artificial snags, this puts us in a bit of a precarious situation. Should a sig significant accident occur due to the failure of an artificial snag that was deliberately created, this practice of leaving dead bits of trees standing up might come into question in a legal judgment. There should be at least some basic rules about how we go about creating these snags in public areas and where they could impact upon targets. There's also no guidance on how to re-inspect artificial snags. Industry members have told me they often make a judgment based on a snag's appearance or they push and pull the snag to see if it's still secure and not wobbling about due to base or decay. From experience, nearly all artificial snags, in the UK at least, fail at their base with the full length of them crashing to the ground. I've recorded several time lapses of this happening, as well as having the experience of many more doing the same thing. The longevity of artificial snags is relatively easy to determine if you keep track of a few dozen of them, as I have done. The images on the side show a snag created out of a mature sycamore and one from a mature beech tree. The former lasted only nine years before it fell and it had been cut to a height of 11.7 metres. The latter snag is less than three metres tall and has been a standing snag for over 15 years. Species, structural condition at the time of making the tree into a snag and the height stem diameter ratio are key factors in longevity of an artificial snag. Basically, the taller you make it, the narrower it is and the more decay prone the wood of the tree selected, the shorter your artificial snag will be staying, standing up. Conversely, the shorter you make it, the greater it is in stem diameter and the more durable the wood of the tree that you've made it from, the longer the snag will last. So there's a trade-off to be had here. It may be tempting to keep more of the height of a tree stem when creating an artificial snag. So you're keeping more deadwood resources for site biodiversity. However, the higher you go, the less longevity you'll get from the snag in general and the greater the risks will be that are associated with it. Basic common sense would be to set the height of the snag so that it couldn't reach any static target of value, a path, a road, a railway line, a building that may be occupied and so on. However, in some situations, 
one might accept the short term risk of a taller snag for the sake of its benefits to site biodiversity, as long as there was a commitment to reinspect and eventually deliberate remo deliberately remove it. My own research into the use of artificial snags by great spotted woodpeckers identified that these birds would create cavities and nest into these snags at heights of only four to six metres above the ground. But they really prefer to be away from human disturbance and dog workers in particular, no doubt. So creating artificial snags in out of the way locations in public parks, away from the pathways, deep in the woods, both reduces the risk from them to park users and also makes it more likely they will be used by key wildlife such as woodpeckers. OK, so what have we learned from this hot take? There is no doubt that this developing practice of making artificial snags is beneficial to site biodiversity. However, as an industry, we need some more formal guidance putting in place to validate the practice and to cushion us against litigation. The risks from snags is generally very low. I mean, really low. But it would only take one legal case in the UK or elsewhere to make it much harder to justify creating snags if we do not have professional guidance on how they should be selected and created. As part of that guidance, we need to understand the trade-off between snag height, snag longevity and the risk to potential targets from what we are creating. There should also be clear guidance on acceptable ways to reinspect and assess the structure of snags once we've made them so that their associated risks are being actively managed. The image here shows another of my time lapses here of a tall beach snag in a public park. Notice it's an artificial snag in Manchester, England. This tall beach snag lasted about as long as one would expect, around 10 years. And the parks management team called it right, I would say, arguably, and removed it at the right time. We do need to think this practice through more and avoid leaving a legacy of decaying snags, which will inevitably fall over in a relatively short time after we've recreated them. We should ensure we're not leaving others to deal with unreasonable risks or liabilities. The key message here is not to create tall and thin snags in the high public use areas and off great, often creating a snag of only four to seven meters in height gives far better longevity than going much higher and that's tall enough for woodpeckers which are keystone species for standing in dead wood you know, if you can sight it in a really low use area so much the better thanks for listening to my hot take talk again soon